Good afternoon, Campbell McCreary here, Amvest Capital in New York City. Welcome to the Amvest Capital Inc. live webinar with Hillcrest Energy Technologies. Trades on the venture is HRH and on the OTCQB as HLRTF. Hope you'll enjoy today's program. It'll be available in replay mode. Feel free to chat in your questions in the question pane of the GoToWebinar panel or simply email them in and we'll ask the questions in real time. Um, Replay will be available in about an hour uh, after we wrap up at amvestcapital.com slash webinars. New York, uh, Amvest is a New York-based specialist investment management and corporate finance firm focused solely on the natural resource uh, sector. Um, this call is, is for informational purposes only. Uh, please let's to have uh, three persons from the company today. Um, Mike Cruz, executive chairman, technical director, Don Curry, CEO and Director, and Ari Berger, Chief Technology Officer, CTO. Um, welcome to the show. And Mike, if you want to share your screen, we'll uh, take a dive into Hillcrest. Very well. Excellent. All right. Thanks, Campbell. I appreciate the introduction. We appreciate the opportunity to uh, to be able to talk. I think we have uh, just shy of 250 people on the call, so this is a this is a great opportunity for us to be able to let people know where we've come from, where we are, and some of our aspirational ideas. One thing I will mention right off the top: we are not on the TSX venture anymore. Our symbol is not HRH. It's on the bottom of the screen. We're on the Canadian Securities Exchange. Uh, our symbol is H E A T Heat. We're, uh, we like that symbol. Uh, one other thing is that uh, I would also like to thank Amvest. Uh, not only are they providing this webinar for us, but have been a, a trusted and valued advisor uh, over the last couple of years. Amvest and uh, some of their clients have participated in numerous private placements, have introduced us to uh, people to come along, and uh, were the key factors in introducing us to the family office in New York that provided the $5 million financial facility which we drew down 2.24 million uh, just a short time ago. Um, and again, thank you. Uh, Amvest has been around for a while and, and we're happy to have them. Next slide, please, Mike. Forward-looking statements, the necessary evil. Uh, the, the presentation will be posted on our website soon and everybody can uh, take a look at, at they want. Our path forward, our mission and our vision statement, you know, it's it's, while we go through this presentation, it's going to be more of a casual approach, but one of the things that came clear to me uh, not too long ago was I was asked, when did when did we kind of have the aha moment? When did we realize that things had changed substantially? And there's, we think about it every day because we're, we're running hard, as our investors will know, and, and we're trying to make things happen quickly. But there are, uh, there are two or three things that happen. Number one, um, the financial the financial situation of the company over the last six to eight months has changed dramatically. We've gone from two and a half million, three million dollars in debt to no debt and a couple million dollars in the bank. That's that's incredible for a company our size to be able to have seen the growth and and the and the, maybe the stability come in the short time frame that we've had. And and it's all due to the change in focus and and the interest in the, in the public. The second part is because of that and because of where we're going. The other part was to actually sit back and realize that there are some very quality people that are prepared to get involved in our company, the latest being Michael Moscovich, uh, who, who came to the thing. In talking to him, realizing, uh, getting his insight, getting his his thoughts on where we're trying to go and whatnot, it was invaluable. It just, it just made me realize that we're on the right path or believe we're on the right path as a team. And the last, and this, this sounds crazy, but while we were going through the, uh, the oil we knew that maybe 10, 20 percent of uh, the world's investment population might think about investing in oil or carbon-based carbon uh, opportunities. It was a tough go. We now realize that there's about 100 percent of the world that's interested in talking about uh, clean tech, clean energy. So much so that when uh, before we launched our new website, I showed it to uh, my daughter. She showed it to her business uh, uh, teacher at school, and they actually made a. a a project of it and he called me and he, he was he was talking to us about the choice to change and so we realized that we're accessing far bigger far bigger group around the world and quite frankly everybody because everybody realizes this is a path that uh, has unlimited unlimited potential we're a business that's part of a movement and we're proud of it and i think we're building towards being an integral part of that next page please 
The marketplace is evolving. This goes back to what I was saying before. These headlines that you see here, they're saying 2020, 2021, the biggest companies in the world are moving towards clean tech, less reliant on carbon-based. The whole world is changing and moving at a faster pace than they thought they would six months ago, let alone a year ago. We're quite proud to say that uh, one of our directors coined the phrase, for us, uh, energy transition strategy, way back in the fall of 2018, when I say way back in the fall, it's, uh, it's a long time coming. We spent a year looking at where we wanted to go, what we wanted to do last June or May when we announced that we had signed a licensing agreement with a, uh, with a technology, everything exploded for us. We realized the pent up demand, the, the interest of, for people that would want to get involved and, and, and want to follow a company. And we've taken that uh, humbly and, and really thought that our, we want to be involved in that. And our next, uh, our next steps were to make sure that we had the team and the opportunities to, uh, to be able to be involved in that. So, you know, the last five years, there's been more development than the previous 50 combined and uh, we're proud to be a part of it. Next page, please. The new business model, everybody knows, but just to recap, uh, we're deploying a new business model and we're, we're looking to protect long-term shareholder value. This is a marathon, not a sprint. We're accelerating, you know, the accelerating urgency in building a low carb, carbon economy. That speeds up on a monthly basis, it can't be can't be overemphasized how fast the transition is happening. Regulatory requirements and expanding government incentives. Government is funding programs. Uh, government is, is encouraging. We were actually dealing with the municipality where the person said that any PO order that purchase order that he takes has to be part of an energy efficiency program and has to be in the green space. He has no choice. It's being it's being designed. Investor demand. We've uh, I've already mentioned it. The investor demand is huge. People are looking for something that can be long-term. People are looking for something that has growth. And I still think that nobody fully understands, ourselves included, the actual scope and size of where this could lead to over the, over the next little while. And the social drivers, it's the same as investor demand. The social uh, communities are, are demanding uh, more carbon efficient or carbon free uh, communities and access to, access to power and, and alternatives to what exists now. And, and you can even look at it where some regulations say that there may not be a, a gas driven car for uh, by 2035. And that's just around the corner. 15 years from now, 14 years from now um, is, is not that long away. So the social drivers are a key component to uh, where we're, uh, a key component to uh, pushing us in the direction that we're going. Next slide, please. Part of a developing company in, in and any existing company in, in this particular space is what people have always heard as ESG, environmental, social, and governance. And we're, we're committed to following that. It is, it is so important right now that our company be viewed as not only following the path, but actually leading the path for a smaller company. Um, we intend to have an institutional following and we intend to bring more institutions to the table as we, uh, as we perform and, uh, and, and grow, grow value. There are institutions right now that they look at the company to see what their ESG policies are, practices are, if they're just stating it or if they're following it and living it. And in our particular case, we're not uh, we're not waiting to be regulated or forced into that. We're already following that path. And over the next little bit, I think what you'll find is there'll there'll be announcements and there'll be people brought on board that will will give indication as to how that's going to be followed. The environmental, I'll give you one example of where we're, it's small for a company like ours, but it's it's telling. Um, as you all know, we have an oil site in uh, in Saskatchewan that is producing uh, the revenue that we live on at this point in time. And we have four wells there that have reached their economic value and haven't produced in, in years, three, four years, maybe five years. Well, technically, we're not required to... Uh, to shut those wells in or remediate the land to its original state until such time as we abandon the field. I think for us to show to show that we're living the life of what we're trying to say we're going to do, we've decided to uh, reclaim those wells, put, a, put the land back to its original state. It's a small capital investment for us, but it was so overwhelmingly positively received with the government when we told them we were gonna be proactive instead of reactive to their demand that it's just one small step that we're doing. Diversity in the company and, uh, and our, our governance policies will also become more apparent as we go along. Next page. 
clean energy technology portfolio. This is a recap of where we're at and we'll have a chance to answer questions and explain even more later on. But right now our electric machine controlled software, we own IP, we have Hillcrest owned IP. The inventor, Ari Berger, who you're all gonna hear from in a minute, is now with Hillcrest. We're very, very happy to have him and it's been a massive addition to the team. Uh, he brings credibility, experience, capability to us that we thought would be a little more down the road as we were trying to build the team. Uh, customizable applications for a variety of high value, high performing electromechanical systems. It's a mouthful. Bottom line is we're not a company that's looking to try to build something that just comes off the shelf. We don't want you to be going to your Walmart and picking up a Hillcrest thing. We're going for high value, high performing, something that can make a difference in the world. And uh, we think over time, uh, those, those sort of ideas will become more apparent to you. Software IP, we're developing software IP, and that requires limited capital to develop and can be easily updated. That's, that's Ari's specialty, and he can explain a little bit more on that later, but it's not a capital intensive part of the whole process. The Power Electronics Collaboration, five-year technology development collaboration, it's a partnership. The word collaboration is, is one that we like to use. It's one that's, that's very indicative, but there's more to it than what, what uh, the word collaboration means. Proven power electronics expertise with unparalleled energy uh, density and efficiency. The, the owner, the, uh, Systematic in Germany, they have an established network in the EV auto industry. One of the benefits of dealing with one of the world's top developers such as Systematic is that they already have a customer base. We've, we potentially have kind of checked two boxes with, with one simple addition. And, uh, and uh, expect to be able to take advantage of, uh, of that established network. And the expensive experience, experience commercializing technology, and that's important. When Ari first came to the company, and sorry for quoting you, Mark, uh, Ari, and when you brought Harold to the, to the table, one of the things that they will tell you is that they are, they've gone from concept to commercialization on numerous occasions. And when they take a purchase order, they perform and complete. We're getting involved with people that we know that once we go down a path, while it might not get to 100% of what we thought it would be, we will complete the task at hand. That's very, very important to be, be known as not only idea people, but as, uh, as uh, people that can complete the task in front of us. Next slide, please. This is a very simple slide, but we, we, we come across this in, uh, on numerous occasions when people are asking us, what is the difference between the control system and the power electronics? And the simple, the simple answer, and it couldn't be simpler here, is that the control system software is the brains of an electric machine. Everything Ari does takes the technology and, and, and tells the parts what to do, how to do it, when to do it, and when to adjust from, uh, from each side. And the, electronic, uh, the power electronics, it's the muscles. It's actually the machine that's working after it's being told how to work. Where can we put what we're working on to work? And this, if it doesn't say at all, it, it, it's, hard, it's hard to get bigger than this. There is no place where an electric motor exists that we can't have an effect based on what we believe we're working on. Automotive, aeronautics, renewable energy, consumer electronics, there's many, many, many others. The, the scope of where we can proceed or where we can go is limitless and endless. And uh, I, I, think, I think we have some opportunities at, at the doorstep that uh, over a period of time, we'll, uh, we'll make it known a little bit more, but this gives you a scope of, we're not limited in where we want to focus. Executing, a summary of the last year, and, and we're quite proud of this, and we, and we should be. We've, we've done a lot in a short period of time, and, and with, the, with the small team that's, that's building. We've eliminated our outstanding debt, and we've increased our base revenues. That's a key, and I will always come back to the fact that I know of maybe none, but I'll say very few small companies that have a revenue stream at their base while they go and approach the future. So we are transitioning, but we have a revenue stream that allows us to keep the company going, allows it to pay the company bills while we pursue the ultimate object objective, which is a full transition over to energy, clean energy and clean technology. We have a $5 million equity facility in base I, I, or in place. I know there will be questions on this. We're very happy to have it. The, uh, uh, the provider of it, a family office in, in, uh, in New York, provided it. They converted the first draw right into, right into cash stock at the, at the closing, which is phenomenal. They're a major shareholder in our company. 
Um, we've got $2.7 million still remaining on the facility to be drawn down um, when we need it. Uh, we'll discuss that later on in the future. But at this point in time, $2.24 million was drawn, wiped out everything else on the books. We've added to the team, Michael Moskowitz and David Farrell as strategic advisors. We've, we're trying to add people in areas where we need the most, uh, the most experienced and the most knowledgeable. And in this case, David Farrell comes from a background of M&A, over 25, being involved in over $25 billion worth of financial mergers and acquisition deals. Michael Moskowitz, we just announced him, and as everybody knows, CEO and chairman of Panasonic North America. That, that is an incredible thing to say from our company's point of view. It, it gives us confidence, and it also, it just, it just lets us know that people in the industry far, far bigger companies than we have, believe in maybe our ideas, our dreams, and can point us in a direction that we maybe haven't considered in the past. But that's that's a key component, key addition to the board, and, and quite proud to say he's on side. Ari Berger, he was appointed Chief Technology Officer. We started talking about Ari in October, I believe. It came on as a, an advisor, moved to Manager of Technology until we were able to purchase his, uh, his company, Anago. And he's now on full time and a major component of the company, obviously. The joint technical planning with Systematic is well underway. When I say that, Ari has a relationship with, uh, with Systematic that goes back years. He can talk about that in a minute. But the bottom line is that uh, we've hit the ground running. It is, it is interesting to watch two inventive minds talk on, not once a week, almost every day a week, talking about what the potential is where they've got the base and how we're going to get there. There is, uh, there's a lot of work done already. And um, uh, all I'll say at this point is watch this space. It's, it's inspiring to watch the two work together, the two teams work together. We're establishing in-house design and development capabilities, more, more to follow on that. And uh, we are talking about additional partnerships and collaborations in discussion. We will always have a business funnel. We will always have a funnel of potential opportunities that we look at. It doesn't mean we'll be able to close on each and every one of them we do. That's part of the due diligence process. But what we have to do is we have to be aware that you've got to have, we need to have more than one thing in the, in the pipeline at any given time uh, to be able to grow the company in, at the speed and at the size that we expect to be able to or want to be able to. Opportunities. You know, uh, we're we're hoping to retain investor confidence with ongoing cash flows. If, you know, people are going to ask, how long can you survive? Well, we can survive a long time. We can survive a long time. We've got cash flow to keep the company alive. We we've we've talked about that already, um, and that can grow. We'll we'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, the acceleration of demand for e-mobility and electrification. As I said, it's a 25 billion dollar industry per year, growing by a rate of almost five percent over the next five years. I actually think that might go, you know, in my humble opinion, I think that's a that's a low number, the 5%, because it's happening faster. If you would have talked about how many EV cars were going to be on the road a year ago or how many companies were totally, totally transitioning to electric vehicles over the next 10 years, eight, nine months ago, it wouldn't be as many as there are now. So it's happening in a in a in a very, very, very uh, quick time frame. We we think from a company perspective. We have some things in place that other small companies tend to suffer for. You know, as I said, we have money in the bank. We're we're in we're in a sector that's hitting its stride. We're uh, we're addressing current and long-term growth. So we're we're looking for smaller opportunity here, but the big prize will be described later on. We're partnering with industry leaders. It's uh it's it was an original original objective to get involved with people and to be able to grow with them. And we had smaller companies we were talking to and there was opportunity there. We, we appreciate every conversation we've had with anyone that's involved in the space. But we're looking, for, we're looking for partners that are industry leaders now. And if you go back to the, uh, the Michael Moskowitz edition, I think we're being noticed. And I think that that's, uh, that's, a, that's a proper way to go. Um, we'll pursue funding, but we're not dependent on government funding. There is government funding that comes along. Uh, funding, uh, funding itself, I find, is uh, is on an as-need basis where uh, more doors are opening to us, and um, there's people knocking on the door asking if they can be involved with us, and we're in an enviable place right now to be able to, where we weren't a year and a half ago, uh, where we'll be able to 
look at what they're offering, what they're charging, and what it'll do for us. So uh, we're in, we're in a little bit stronger. Uh, we're in a little bit stronger, and uh, you know we're in the right sector. Let's face it; it's a growth sector. Uh, everybody wants efficiency and performance, and everything that we're about is about efficiency and performance in what we're trying to develop. Next slide, please. Value proposition. You know, it's design thinking with technical insights. You know, it's we're driving product creation, design to value capabilities. As I mentioned earlier, both Ari and, and Systematic, they're, they're concept to commercialization people. They've done it over and over again, multiple times. So we're, uh, with our software and, and, and power electronics capabilities, we're already ahead of the game than most companies our size or most people, most companies that would be six months, eight months into something like this are. We're, we're far more able to produce and we're expanding our, our opportunities. That's it, it in a nutshell. We're expanding opportunities as go back to that other slide of where we could possibly or potentially be involved in. We would like to say more, but for competitive reasons, we're going to limit it to that. All I can say is uh, we do have opportunities at, on the table. Next slide. Scale readiness. We use this in a press release, and I and I, I really really like this comment. Uh, we're leveraging the specialized skills of our system to buy design capabilities, and uh, uh, we're developing, de-risking, and protecting our core IP. Again, we own something. We have core IP and our R&D innovations. We're considering multiple revenue paths. Uh, it's a constant question. What will we do? We can uh, we can license. We can sell. We can joint venture. That that door is open no matter which way we want to want to go in the future and we're considering all revenues um, and again i'll come back to we're targeting additional strategic partners who have the potential to scale with us that's a key management you have uh three of the four on on here right now uh our our bios are right there mike is the executive chairman has been with the company since the, the beginning of 2014 into 2013 Ari's recent, very happy to have him. We've gone through, uh, we've gone through his. And Dale Miller is the general manager of oil and gas operations. This management team will grow, and you'll see additions to this in the next short while. We're looking to expand the team because we have we have more needs. But for now, this is the core management team. Next slide, please. Our advisors. We can't say enough, and I can't stop smiling when I think about the quality we've been able to bring to the company. It's it's been a it's been a real team effort, and if I haven't said it before, I'll continue to say it now. We're a true team, and we're all on the same page in that in that we're we're trying to build and we're working it together. But it's on a team effort. We've got competence, we've got experience, and we've got uh, we've got ability. David Farrell, president of Visa Consulting, uh, he's had he has over the 25 years experience, as I mentioned, investment banking, uh, M and A been since he's been involved in the company can can never overestimate what value he's given to us as far as advice direction and uh, and uh, and assistance in, in just business planning michael moskowitz again have to smile this is a real key in our cap for uh, him to join our team as an advisor uh, chairman and ceo of panasonic north america uh, he's been with other other groups before but this is an operations person who has his fingers in, the Panasonic has their fingers in many, many, many areas that we may consider. And I think one of the one of the best things that Michael can bring to us is very simply that as a company, while we have $2 million in the bank, and when I, when I talked to him at one time, I said, we don't want to make a mistake. We don't want to spend our capital where others have made that mistake. We want to spend our capital building value and, and making it grow. And uh, I think he's already shown immense value in some of uh, some of our discussions regarding the path and direction that we believe we're looking we're looking to go. Next slide, please. Our board. For anyone that was on a previous presentation, the the addition there is Kylie Dixon. We're uh, we're looking to uh, add to our board. Kylie brings a, an accounting background to us, a, a CPA, and uh, just joined the board approximately a month ago, month and a half ago and has been a, uh, a big value add. The board, the board is such that it will see changes over time as the company, as the company changes. And as we're changing quickly, uh, we're looking for people that would come to the board that would be industry specific or have industry knowledge 
uh, in, the, in the areas that we're pursuing, such as the clean tech and clean energy. Uh, but we're, we're very happy to have the board that we have right now. Next slide. We haven't gone a long time, but it's, it's key to, to think about the bright future. We're quite proud of where we are. We had in here, we're in the right place at the right time with the right team. I would actually step out on a limb and say, we were in the right place before many others. We just didn't realize the scope and the opportunity that existed for us as we move forward. It was, it was, it's incredibly exciting to come into work every day. And well, it's not work. This is fun now. We're at the right, at the right time. So we were there before the right time and we're at the right team. And this team is gonna grow. You're going to see more people added to it as we build up. Growing demand for design to value capabilities, again, right place, right time, right, right area. We have multiple revenue stream creations. We have the immediate, which is the oil revenues, near-term near acquisitions and partnerships, which will be detailed as we go along. But we're looking for revenue-based clean tech, clean energy opportunity where revenue exists. So we will be looking at those near-term. And long-term, IP development and commercialization. The key there is commercialization. I think uh, I think one of the uh, one of the best lines I heard or was advised of is that people ask for timelines, and and this is not my line, but I love it and I'm going to use it over and over again. Uh, while we can't give you estimates and timelines, what we can of what we're going to be announcing or what we're going to be doing in the next quarter or two, what we can say is. This company will be completely different a year from now than where it is today. And today, I personally believe, and I'm biased, it's a very exciting company to be involved with. I hope it's a very exciting company for people to invest in. And uh, we hope that you'll continue to watch the screen. We appreciate your support. We appreciate your investment. And we will answer any questions we can to the best of our abilities in the next segment here. Back to you, Campbell. Yep. Good pull on Gabe, and we'll uh, we'll get started. Hi, guys. Uh, thanks for uh, the time today, and thanks um, Don, Ari, and Mike for uh, for the, the presentation. Um, we'll just start with um, uh, an important question uh, that's uh, kind of on everyone's mind: is sort of the status of the uh, various LOIs and MOIs, uh, such as the ones with ACDC and EVCO. Don? Yeah, sure. Uh, ACDC is uh, an interesting company. What we did is we announced the LOI back in November, I believe, and then they put out a press release in January that they were uh, they were waiting for us to complete our, our <coughs> agreement with Anago, which we completed April 6th. Uh, there has been contact between us. We do like some of the things that they have in place. Remember when we originally got involved with them, and what we publicly talked about was the Echoville uh, project, which is uh, a development, a 100-unit development in Squamish, BC, that will be completely carbon-free, uh, all clean energy. Um, we're, we're in discussions. We're in contact. We won't discuss what that is at this point in time, uh, but uh, any developments or any material events, we will, we will def definitely update our shareholders on. And e EVCO, obviously not the real name of the company. It's a private company located here. They're, uh, they're a charging company, uh, have revenues. We're going through the due diligence process as we speak, and it's, it, it sounds simple, but it's not. So there's many, many, many layers as to what they have, what they're doing, where they're going, where we can add value. That discussion is on. And um, again, any developments that would occur from there, we will definitely let the public know. Great, thank you for that answer. Um, just to follow up, Don, a lot of investors uh, originally invested in the company based on Alset and RegenX technology. Where are you at with uh, testing and are you still moving that forward? Yeah, I guess the best way to explain that, and this comes up all the time, the best way to explain that is we have a licensing agreement to, to license any product that is developed by the original owner. Alset is a combination or is a, co a a joint venture between Oropass and, um, and Hillcrest. And so when a, when a product becomes available to license, we will do so. We are more of a reactionary company now than a proactive company in this regard, in the fact that we, we've asked for and require independent third-party testing. And our idea of an independent third-party testing, and maybe 
other people's idea is not the same thing. We're continuing to pursue that. We're continuing to work on that. But while we do that, and this is the important thing, and this is where I've answered it many, many times in emails. While we do that, it's dependent or it's, it's incumbent upon us as a company to have options available. And what we found is by bringing Ari in and the collaboration that he brought in with, with Systematic and some of the other things that we're working on is that we'll make sure that there's value in the company and there will be some projects that may not proceed the way we wanted to at the beginning. We're still there, we're a licensing group. If something comes around to license or if something changes, we'll let the public know. Great, that's a good uh, segue into a question to for Ari, uh, a couple of questions for Ari. Um, I guess the, to start out, um, sort of the big picture, you know, we heard originally you approached uh, Hillcrest. Um, so what, what drew you to the company? Yeah, sure. Um, well, it was actually by, by accident that I came aware of, of uh, Hillcrest. And what I noticed was um, their wish to pivot from oil and gas to uh, clean tech. Now, that, that actually catched my, my eye, you know, and, and I said, mm, that's interesting. Let's, let's see how, uh, how they plan to do that. Uh, that's, that's how the connection started. Um, and, you know, we started talking, started dating, and um, that's basically it. That's where we are today. And we, um, I just found, you know, really highly professional people. Um, who are <clears throat> really um, support innovation and are not afraid to uh, aim for the moon uh, with their vision. Um, and, you know, at the end of the day, throughout, you know, during the time and, and all our meetings and discussions, and we also, uh, you know, develop really good personal relationship. I just found people that, that I can trust and, and I guess it's, it's mutual. Um, you know, people, we can build a good team and, and uh, with good future. Thank you. Um, can you just explain briefly the relationship between Hillcrest and Systematic? Yeah, sure. Uh, so maybe just a bit of a background. I, um, I actually met Systematic uh, about six years ago. Uh, I had the, <clears throat> the pleasure to do a couple of uh, projects with them uh, in which basically we, we became aware of each other capabilities. Um, I, during that time, I developed a really good personal relationship with Harold, Hen uh, Harold Hengstenberger, who is the uh, founder and owner, a super talented guy. Um, and... Um, you know, once once we saw that uh, the, the relationship here with, with Hillcrest is going forward, I contacted him. I told him, look, there's, uh, I think there's really good opportunity. I'm involved. Um, so he was excited and, um, and we decided to move forward. Uh, now, basically, I think, in my opinion, uh, Systematic is one of the best design houses in the world for power electronics. And... Something to uh, maybe to understand is that um, you can make a really sophisticated software, but eventually it will be uh, it will be bound to uh, the the hardware capabilities and vice versa. By the way, um, collaboration between Hillcrest, <clears throat> the software IP, and Systematic that has extensive experience know-how in the electronics puts us in a really, really high, high place, high capabilities. I'm very excited just to talk about it. And I truly believe that the sky is the limit in this collaboration. Um, so that's basically the, um, I think that's, I summarized the, the relationship. <clears throat> it's complementary um, capabilities. Our side is the software, systematic side is the hardware. And they just, they have to live together like, like Don showed before. One is the brain, the other is the muscle. Uh, and that's it. Okay, thank you. And so, so on that, is, is there, Don, is there any like 100% ready for market IP, whether software, hardware, or a combination that was acquired from Anago, or is there more work to be done there? I'm actually going to pass this over to Mike. He was, uh, he's the most intricately involved in that. So Mike, why don't you answer this question? Yeah, great question. Um, truly great question. 
So um, our main focus is on a couple of um, very substantial and impactful uh, tech development projects with Systematic, and they seriously are impactful projects. Um, Don used the term world changing. I don't know if it'll change the world, but it'll certainly change parts of it if we're successful. But um, back when Ari first came to us, he, uh, he came to us with his proprietary IP, but he also came to us with uh, several applications that could be immediately um, pursued that uh, could commercialize his IP and um, we get straight after it. Um, so he came not only with uh, the software and the IP, but also uh, commercialization opportunities right out of the gate. We very quickly got connected with Systematic um, after Ari joined and uh, very quickly in the course of those discussions, we found that um, there has been a lot of proprietary soft hardware, I should say, developed at Systematic over the years that is directly complementary to and integral with, uh, or potentially integral with RE software. So very quickly, we, we've come up with a number of uh, hardware and software applications, uh, specific high value applications that we could choose to pursue and probably deliver within six to 12 months. Our challenge is, uh, we need to manage our resources, so we're, we're, we're working out how we can potentially pursue some of the, call it low-hanging fruit, some of these, uh, these, these quicker uh, cycle time opportunities while we're pursuing our, uh, our main uh, tech project developments. So that's kind of where it sits. Yes, there are uh, projects that we can pursue immediately. We're trying to work out how we can uh, get the most value with the resources and talent we have. Thanks, Mike. And in terms of those projects, um, uh, I guess Don has the development uh, started for the new technology research development facility uh, that you mentioned in a, in a prior press release this year. Yeah, yeah, it actually has. And, and um, I think we've all had that that time at Christmas where you're getting what you want, and, and it's fun to walk around with Ari. We we have we have located space. We have ordered equipment. We'll be making. Uh, we'll be issuing a release as to when it's open, but uh, you know it's it's important to understand that our our development our development facility is uh, it's starting out as as a, a a replica of the one in in Germany, so that Ari and Ari and Harold will be working live time uh, together, or the teams will be working live time together and have the test benches and have so on and so forth. So yes, the the short answer is yes, it has. Okay, can we uh, just switch gears for a moment and talk about um, uh, revenue forecast, cash burn, um, you know, how you, you expect it to change over the period here, and, um, and you know, do you expect to draw on any more of the, of the facility? Yeah, okay, uh, the answer is um, financial forecast, yes. Right now, our, our revenue comes from oil, and we, we just have, gone through the process of, of forecasting the next year and what that will happen and and is there going to be future developments so on and so forth we're uh, uh, previously on a good month we'd bring in $120,000 in, in oil revenue our last two months have exceeded one was 270 one was 250 so the financial forecast in the, in the oil field that's that we're not forecasting revenues on the tech side yet we will uh, well, it's it's a process in, it's a process in working the uh, cash burn rate over the last four months, you could say it's been an average of about $75,000 a month. And uh, and as I said, with the revenue that's coming in, that covers our cash burn rate. That will expand. We are bringing in uh, a couple more engineers. We are bringing in some people. So that will expand. But current cash uh, cash burn or uh, uh, burn rate is, uh, is, is easily handled. And then do we expect to use the remaining 2.7 on the facility? I think we're in a place now that the answer is that we're going through our budget, we're going through our projections, and uh, we, we're we not in a bad spot right now. That facility is there when we need it. We also have other opportunities that could be presented to us, and we will take what is the most cost-effective and beneficial to the company at the time, but we uh, we greatly appreciate what the family office has provided to us. They're a valued, they're a valued partner, and uh, while there's no plans at this point in time to access that when capital is needed, they're definitely part of the consideration. Excellent. Um, are, there's a mention on this, on the Echoville project. Are, uh, when, when are you planning to start that? 
that's not for us to start. The, uh, the Echo Bill project and any involvement we would have on that would be putting the brains to it, putting the control system. So um, uh, that's a better question for the company. And that would that would only be a question when uh, when we had our definitive agreement done, if and when it gets done. Okay. Um, are there any more partnerships in, in the pipeline? You never want to be too short, but the answer is yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I talk about it right now, but the answer is yes. Okay. And then in terms of sort of commercialization, the current of the current tech you have in Europe or North America, sort of what are your what are your target markets for that, Don? Well, this is the beauty of it. We don't have borders. What we're working on now isn't constrained by a border or to a, a certain country. So we're looking at applications that can be used worldwide. So um we're not constrained. We're not looking at one different jurisdiction. We're looking at where our solution can be put into the opportunities that exist and that's not constrained by border. Okay, so I guess is the uh, technology being developed in-house to be licensed or what's the model? Again, I think we, we touched on that. There's, there's many different models. We can either, uh, we're, we're developing in-house, we're working with uh, Systematic, and that anything that we have developed can be licensed, can be sold, can be joint ventured. Uh, that'll, be de that'll be dependent on the, on the people we're talking to and the, and the steps that we're taking. So there's, the options are our options, um, but it hasn't yet been decided. Just one last question on this before I switch over uh, to just a quick um, update on on the oil and gas activities with Mike. Um, have you applied for any government grants uh, related to the clean energy uh, mandates? No, we haven't applied, but we have aligned ourselves uh, and are looking at uh, at various grants that could be available for us at different stages for development, commercialization, so on and so forth. That's that's the one beauty of, of pursuing a clean tech or clean energy focus is that there are numerous government grants worldwide that you can access. So while we haven't applied yet, we're definitely making ourselves aware of what exists and when we can start looking to uh, to obtain some of those or apply for some of those. Okay, thanks. Uh, so Mike, on the, um, the the new well, could you give us an update and uh, what you know what are your plans at West Hazel? Um, and if you can just give us some some general financial metrics on 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 the operations there today. Sure. Okay. Well, top down, our obviously, as Don said, um, our oil business is where our revenue comes from, and that's the sustaining revenue that uh, we're using to uh, to build a clean energy tech business. The um, the objective is to um, to use that for that purpose. But while while we're doing that, we're very attenuated toward reducing our environmental footprint to the extent possible. Don mentioned earlier that we're remediating a number of unused um, surface locations and roads to uh, to return that to its original state. Um, everything we're doing is trying to reduce the, uh, the carbon footprint of our operation. We electrified the field um, some months ago, which is saving us money as, as well as doing that. So there's um, it's currently producing about, um, call it between 100 and 150 barrels a day. Uh, and that's mostly from the wells prior to the one that we drilled. Um, those, um, that 100, 150 barrels a day, it just to, to um, clarify uh, some of the numbers Don was talking about before, he was talking revenue numbers. The field in the first four months of the year was throwing about $70,000 a month in free cash flow to be used for, uh, for clean tech company expenses, et cetera. Um, we drilled the well in Q1. And uh, it's not yet hooked up to our production facilities, but we expect that to happen within the next month or so. When we tested the well, when we initially brought it on, uh, we produced it to a tank uh, for a number of days, and it was producing by itself well in excess of 100 barrels a day. It was difficult to measure, but uh, that's a good well, uh, and we're, we've got high expectations for when we bring it into the production facility. We're planning to drill more wells. I think there's probably maybe three, maybe four wells left in that field, which we could uh, all drill from existing surface locations to minimize uh, environmental footprint and, and further disturbance. Um, and if we're aggressive about it, we could we could probably drill three wells by the end of the year, subject to, um, to decisions we need to take about deployment of capital resources, et cetera. But um, if we do that, we're probably north of 350 barrels a day 
by the end of the year or early next year. And that in round numbers would probably give us around 350 to $400,000 a month in free cash flow. Um, so that's really the value of the oil is to provide the funding to, to, to accelerate that transition. Um, our oil price, realized oil price, let's say in a, in a WTI or West Texas Intermediate pricing regime of uh, say 60 to $65 US a barrel, uh, because it's heavy oil and it needs to be transported, et cetera, we get about $50 US for our oil uh, on those prices. Our operating costs at current production rates are somewhere around, call it 20 to 25 US dollars a barrel, because the rates are low. But at something like the 350 that I was talking about that we hope to be at around this time next year, if we drill those wells, that'll drop to well below $10 a barrel. Um, and you know that's great nerdy numbers, but at the end of the day, uh, what it tells you is that we're robust to oil price, oil price declines. We're very, very robust to that. So that even with um, potential reductions in, uh, in oil price, if it does correct, we still expect a significant uh, revenue stream coming from the oil. Good news. Um, just a couple more questions and then I think we'll move to close, uh, Campbell. But um, so Ari, um, could you just surmise, uh, you know, I guess, uh, and how, you know, in a way to, to help us better understand uh, systems engineering and why it's important for a company um, like Heat? Yeah, sure. Uh, actually, a very good question. Thanks for that. Uh, well, what we're dealing with are, um, you know, the technologies, the, the, the products, they're not standalone. Uh, it's not like a laundry machine that, that just stands and, and operates by itself. It's, it's, uh, it's part of a system. Um, and the understanding of, of the whole system is what allows us uh, basically to aim uh, at the highest value uh, of the development, of the re required development for, for, for addressing um, uh, the, the, let's call it the system challenges. Um, they're not individual, especially in, in the industries, in the application that we're looking at, for example, with electric motors and, and so on. It's, uh, these are complex systems. And I, the, uh, the system engineer comes in and, and basically helps us to identify how we should uh, approach the solution uh, from concept and all the way to uh, a commercialization, uh, design for uh, mass production, and make sure that we uh, we bring the highest value to the system. Um, hope that that answered the question. Yeah, it did. Thank you. And um, just before we close, I always like to uh, kind of look at uh, the other side of the coin in terms of sort of major roadblocks. Uh, on the path to commercialization, what what do you view as the largest hurdle? Um, I'll leave this for Don or Ari. Or... You want to take that, Ari? Can't think of any. Look, I, I, I'll, I'll try to take that. Um, I I don't I don't see any hurdles to be honest. There's no there there are no potential showstoppers out there that are obvious that are going to uh, shoot us out of the saddle, so to speak. There are challenges, right? Um, challenges like we are in a very competitive environment. We happen to think we're very well equipped to play in that environment because of the uh, the IP that uh, that Ari brings and uh, and our um, our relationship with Systematic. Um, we're we're not resource constrained. Uh, we could, you know, the how how far we try to go, how quickly is simply a function of the resources that we put to it. We're in an opportunity rich universe. Um, the, toughest, the toughest issue we're dealing with internally in a business planning sense is deciding what not to do. Um, and that involves trying to make the most, to, to generate the most value from the resources that we have and the resources that we may choose to bring on board. So, you know, I, I, really, I really don't see any, you know, one or two, single things that are looming on the horizon that 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 have our absolute focus um it's it's really just a question of of putting it together in the most effective way to get the biggest the biggest bang for buck if you like in terms of uh, how we spend our resources which include both our capital and our uh, our human potential 
Excellent. Thank you so much, uh, Campbell. Sure. I want to thank everyone for tuning in. Campbell, and, uh, if I could just jump in for a minute, because yeah. I, I think it, I think it's important that we leave everybody with the with the excitement that we have every day. And the person that creates that excitement is Art. Mike and I had an idea. The board had an idea. We pursued it. But the capability to pull that idea off or to understand the farce, the full scope of that idea comes from the person on the screen. And and last thing, last thing that I uh, I do want to say regarding uh, Ari is that it didn't come up in this in this call, but when Ari worked his deal with us, he took majority compensation or payment in that in shares. He's a believer in the future of the company. Ari, do you want to make any comment on that as to your thoughts, your opinion? Yeah, and uh, it's, a, it's a good point. Um, yeah, our decision was uh, was such because it's uh, it's really a, a belief in in the whole team capabilities, um, bringing so many uh, talents here. Not only the technical, and and I think Don and Mike are being a bit uh, humble on this call, but it's. Yeah, you can't do it with, without the, uh, the, the um, you know, the uh, uh, great management and the, uh, the capabilities that uh, the team is, the team is bringing. It's, it's the whole package and um, it just made, made a lot of sense for us uh, to trust this team. Anyway, sorry for interrupting Campbell. I thought that yeah, was a good bring it back to you for a closing statement, but you 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 beat me to it. So I uh, do want to thank everyone for tuning in. You'll be queued for feedback on your way out and in an email. As I've said before, uh, a the replay will be available. You'll get an email for that. It's also will be uh, up in about an hour at ambestcapital.com slash replays. And um, if you forget all that in about 10 days, two weeks, it will make itself to YouTube. And so you can Google it <laughs> and uh, probably it'll end up on your website uh, around then too. So thank you everyone. Uh, it's been a great uh, shared journey. So with that, um, we'll, we'll close. Pick it up. Thank again, you very right? much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thanks. Appreciate the opportunity.